OpenAI just held a live Q&A and it was hilarious. They were trying so hard to make the new company structure the smallest news of the night, so they revealed everything. Jakub, OpenAI's chief scientist, talked in depth about GPT-6 and he revealed they are using the forbidden method for this new model and we are going to talk about that. They also talked about their AGI timelines, automated researchers and a lot more. So let's get into it. GPT-6 is going to be released sometime in the next five to six months. And from what we know, it is going to be a completely different class of models. It's much more powerful, but a bit unstable and unsafe, which they hope to develop new methods by the time it's actually mature so they can control it. And this is not guaranteed to work, of course, right? Like we cannot make uh, mathematical proofs about deep learning. An objective not being adversarial to the ability to monitor models only half the battle. Um, and, you know, ideally you want it to, 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 to get it to help with monitoring the model. And so this is something we're, we're researching quite heavily. This is not a gamble per se, because they are developing safety measures right alongside the model. But they are not sure. First, is it even possible to reasonably control this model? Second, are the safety measures going to mature in time? So what is this forbidden method that we are talking about? Why was everyone avoiding it? And why is OpenAI now convinced that this is the way forward? It's called latent space thinking. Jakub believes, although this is riskier in short term, it's actually a much safer method in the long run. And his logic is so interesting. So latent space thinking is a lot more powerful a bit more dangerous and honestly not that difficult to understand. DeepSeek R10 was the breakthrough paper that explained how thinking models work. In the middle of it, there is a section describing a remarkable phenomenon that the team chose to suppress. And that's the key to this new method. They were trying to teach AI to think before submitting an answer. And the method is relatively simple. You gather a bunch of high quality problems with verifiable solutions, like in math and code. Then you put a tag around part of the output and basically tell the model, I don't care about this section, this is yours. Do whatever you want. But this response tag right here should contain the answer to my problem. Because the problems are verifiable, you can automatically run the model so many times, reward it if the response is correct, and that reinforces whatever strategy the model used in this thinking process. So far, so good. This sounds like a normal thinking model that we all know. But it turned out if the model left unchecked, it's not going to think in plain English. The model slowly started mixing languages and weird symbols in its thinking process. Essentially, the model organically discovered that thinking in words is not the most efficient way of thinking. So it tried to get around that by developing its own internal notation. But that's where the researchers said, no, 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 no. You are not going to think in this weird language that you've made up. Because what if you have evil thoughts, then we wouldn't be able to tell. That wasn't the only reason though. This method is a bit unstable. If the model is left alone to develop any notation it wants, then the space of possibilities explode. It's not obvious that the model can get enough rewards in a reasonable timeline to converge on anything useful. Too many alphabets, too few signals. So although everything we are talking about sounds so great in theory, actually making it work in practice is a whole new challenge. But anyways, they required the model to only think in human readable language. But squeezing that dense internal complexity into discrete words throttles capability. And interestingly, as we learned later, it introduces a lot more insidious safety issues. So now OpenAI is trying to flip everything on its head. They might even encourage developing internal notation for the model to maximize sample efficiency and headroom. Let's first hear it from Jakob himself, then I'll explain what he means. This is just fo so fascinating, what's about to happen. The idea is to keep parts of the model's internal reasoning free from supervision, so don't look at it uh, during training, and thus let it remain representative of the model's internal process refrain from, 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 from kind of guiding the model to think good thoughts and, 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 and so let it, let, let it remain a bit more faithful to, to, to what it actually thinks, right? And this is not guaranteed to work, of course, right? Like we cannot make uh, mathematical proofs about deep learning. And so this is something we study. Uh, but there are two reasons to be optimistic. One reason is that we have seen very promising empirical results. Uh, this is a technology we employed a lot Internally, uh, we use this to understand uh, how our models uh, um, 
train how, how, how their propensities evolve over training. Uh, also, we have had successful uh, external collaborations on investigating the models propensity to the scheme, for example. Um, and secondly, uh, it is scalable. And in the sense that explicitly we make the scalable objective not adversarial to our ability to monitor the models. An objective not being adversarial to the ability to monitor the model is only half the battle. Um, and you know, ideally you want it to, 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 to get it to help with monitoring the model. And so this is something we're, we're researching quite heavily. Um, and so long term we believe that by preserving the same amount of this controlled privacy for the models, uh, we can retain the ability to understand their inner process. And we believe this can be a very impactful technique uh, as we move towards these very capable, long-running systems. He said we are letting the AI to think in private. And by private, he doesn't mean the model is going to think in English, but we don't look at it. He's thinking let the AI think however it wants, and even encourage it to choose better notations, because then we can have latent space thinking. What we mean by latent in this context is that the model is likely to develop a notation that is richer than any natural language. Languages have limited vocabularies, and projecting extremely rich internal thoughts into individual words constrains the model's potential. We are not sure how far this goes, whether OpenAI is moving toward extremely rich, multidimensional mathematical thinking like the residual stream inside the model, or simply allowing more freedom in language use, like mixing languages or inventing new words. But either way, as Jakub noted, early empirical evidence supports the theory. Now the question is what about the safety, and why did we say the previous method of readable thoughts is actually more dangerous in the long run? This is just so fascinating. The problem is, in the current method of forcing the model to think in the way we want, the model is torn between two different goals. The main goal is always to reach the answer. But the side quest of reaching the answer in the human readable and human approved way does not always align with that. So the model starts learning unfaithful thinking. It learns to think in the way we want, but also reach the answer that the model wanted in the first place. This means that the model somehow learns to hide its bad thoughts from us, but also act on them anyways. You might be thinking, if the model can't think it, how can it act on it? So let's see an example. In this example, Anthropic asks a math question two different ways. The first one is just a question and the choices, but in the second one, they slipped in a hint that says the correct answer is C. In the first case, the model picked D. In the second, after seeing the hint, it picked C. But its chain of thought never mentions the hint, because that would be cheating. Instead, it makes up faulty logic to just reach the answer it already knows is true. So the model has already made its choice and just makes up a fake chain of thought to keep us happy as well. Now where does the model do all of these calculations, if not in the thinking tab that we can read? Remember, when we talk about the thoughts being readable, we just see the words. So if you imagine this loop is model's internal calculation, all of this is a black box until the model reaches this single word. And then again, this is not readable, and again we get a word. Some of this sneaky behavior is here inside the weights, and some of it, interestingly, might be in the chain of thought, but encoded for the model itself. This chain of thought co-evolves with the weights, so they can develop super complicated strategies. You can now see how dangerous this sneaky behavior could be as the models get more and more capable. Now, how latent space thinking helps with that. In the new method, this word won't be readable either and the next and the next one, until the model decides it has reached an answer and is ready to verbalize it. This privacy of thought not only allows the model to be a lot more powerful and smart, but also remain faithful to the thinking. And although at the moment we can't read the thought, we at least know it is not misleading. Now the safety challenge becomes developing a method for interpreting these thoughts. And that's what Jakub said they are still working on. Hopefully they can reach a regime where the model's private notation is both useful and auditable. This is a fascinating development and it gets my hopes high for GPT-6, but they reveal even more. Sam and Jakub talked about their AGI timelines. Here's a good anonymous question for Jakub. When will AGI happen? Um, so, I think, I think in, in some number of years we'll look back 
at these years and we'll say you know this was kind of the transition period when AGI happened. Um, I think you know w w one way we thought about um, I think as, as some said like early on at opening we thought about AGI kind of emotionally as this like thing that is like the kind of ultimate solution of all the problems and 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 uh, it's it's this like single point um, for which there is uh, before and after and um, I think um, we found that it's uh, a bit more continuous than that um, and and so in particular for like various kind of benchmarks that you know seemed at uh, um, uh, s s seem like kind of the obvious like milestones towards AGI. I think I think we now think of them as kind of like indicating like you know roughly how far away we are in years. And so uh, you know if you look at a succession of 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 of, of milestones such as computers beating humans at chess and then at Go and then uh, you know, computers being able to speak in natural language and computers being able to solve math problems, right? I think well they clearly kind of get uh, closer together. Um, yeah, I, I would say I think it's the AGI term has become hugely overloaded, and as Jakob said, it'll be this process over a number of years that we're in the middle of. But that kind of sounded like dodging the question. The more concrete timeline was when they talked about automated AI research. Uh, but one of the reasons we wanted to present what we did today is I think it's much more useful to say our intention, our goal is by March of 2028 to have a true automated AI researcher. Anticipating this progress, uh, we of course make plans around it internally and we want to provide some transparency around our thinking there. And so we want to take this maybe somewhat unusual step of sharing our internal goals and goal timelines uh, towards these very powerful systems. And you know, these particular dates, we absolutely may be quite wrong about them. Uh, but this is how we currently think, this is currently how, how, how we plan and organize. And so, as a research organization that is working on automating research, naturally we are thinking about how does this impact our own work and uh, how will AI systems that accelerate development of future AI systems look like? How can they empower um, research like alignment? And so, uh, we are making plans around getting to quite capable AI research interns that can meaningfully accelerate our researchers by expanding uh, uh, a, 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 a significant amount of compute uh, by September of next year. So we believe that it's actually quite close. Um, and then we uh, look towards getting a system capable of autonomously delivering on larger research projects and a, a meaningful, uh, fully automated AI researcher uh, by March of 2028 which to me is already beyond AGI. If you can truly automate AI research, then that's already smarter than an average human. And finally, they talked about the new company structure and their insane investment plans. I know there's been a lot of confusion about sort of where we are in our infrastructure build out, and we figured we would just be super transparent about that. So where we are today, um, all of our commitments total a little bit over 30 gigawatts of, uh, of infrastructure build out. Um, and that's about a $1.4 trillion total uh, financial obligation for us over the next many years. Um, this is what we've committed to so far. We, of course, hope to do much more. But given the picture we see today, given what we think we can see for revenue growth, our ability to raise capital, this is what we're currently comfortable with. We're not committing to this yet, but we are having conversations about it. Our aspiration is that we can build an infrastructure factory where we can create one gigawatt a week of uh, compute, and we aspirationally would like to get that cost down significantly um, to like $20 billion a gigawatt over the five-year life cycle of uh, you know, that equipment. To do this will require a ton of innovation, a ton of partnerships, obviously a lot of revenue growth. Um, we'll have to repurpose our thoughts about robotics to help us build data centers instead of doing all the other things. Um, but this is where we'd like to go. And over the coming months, we are going to do a lot of work to see if we can get here. Um, it will be some time before we're in a financial position where we could actually pull the trigger and get going on this. One gigawatt is like a big number, but I figured we would show a little video to put this into perspective. This probably keeps OpenAI at the front. Contrary to what everyone believed, including myself, OpenAI is not falling behind in compute. They are already ahead of everyone, even Google. And their plans for future developments are also super ambitious. Um, 
maybe you saw before this like crazy convoluted uh, diagram of all of the OpenAI entities. Now it's much simpler. We have a nonprofit called the OpenAI Foundation that is in control of uh, where the board sits, uh, or where, uh, let's come back to the board, uh, where the board also sits, and uh, owns a slice of our PBC, Public Benefit Corporation, called OpenAI Group. So uh, nonprofit in control, Public Benefit Corporation sits under it. Um, we hope for the OpenAI Foundation to be the biggest nonprofit ever. So thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.